Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Virgil Brown is our Deacon of the Week as he comes to bring the announcements and open our time of worship with a blessing. I just want to thank you for being here. This is the fifth Sunday, so we've got some extra music planned for you this week, and I am grateful to each one of you who are here. We are better when you are here, and we are grateful for your presence. Thank you so much, Virgil. Okay. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm not on, I'm a... Uh... Am I? Okay, good. I, I couldn't hear myself. <laughs> I need hearing aids and maybe. Um, it's good to see each of you this morning. We know that on Sunday is the time to be in the Lord's house, and it's good to see you here. Uh, next Sunday, try to bring somebody with you. We've got some, plenty of seats left that we could, uh, we could fill. Our announcements this morning are the card ministry will be meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock. And if you would like to be a part of that or like to come and just watch them do it, that would be, I'm sure they would be happy to have you do that. Uh, it'll be here at the church. Um, I think this is something. Jordan's starting this week and getting a day off. <laughs> the office, <laughs> the office will be closed on Thursday for July the 4th holiday. Uh, the Deacon Nominating Committee uh, needs your input for subjects for nomination to deacons for another term. Uh, please, if you have someone that you'd like to nominate or, or get to the nominating committee, give it to Pastor Frank or um, as you see in the bulletin where you can do it by email if you'd like. Remember Thursday, the women who come to the Bible study have the Bible study. Uh, that it's going to be a potluck supper. So um, I guess it's just the women, so we'll just have to eat a sandwich. <laughs> um, a regular church conference will be held on Sunday, July 28th at 5 p.m. and 5 in the afternoon. The stewardship team will recommend the budget for the fiscal year uh, of 2024-25. Uh, all recommendations or anything that you'd like to put forth before the conference. Please get it to the office no later than July the 10th. 
Um, and we're said that there will be some homemade ice cream after the, uh, the, the uh, conference. So uh, maybe that will bring everybody out. We'll, uh, we'll have good attendance. Um, this morning, uh, Jason Dunlap has something he wants to say to you. Thank you, sir. Hey, I'm Jason Dunlap. I gave Mr. Virgil $20 to buy um, a little bit of uh, his time up here today, sharing some of the announcements. I told him to set the bar low so that I could come in and try to meet his, uh, his energy level up here. Just wanted to talk about the Ice Cream Fellowship. So we are going to be encouraging people to come for the stewardship conference July 28th, but right afterwards we're going to celebrate with some homemade ice cream. Thanks to Josh's help, we have a sign-up sheet right outside the church office, and we're going to have some place at the entrance of the uh, sanctuary. Please sign up, and if you do have a um, homemade ice cream machine, please make notation of that. We'll, we'll, we will have a uh, plan B for backup if we don't have enough ice cream, uh, cream machine to go around. One other thing that I wanted to make sure that I highlighted is at the end of August, we're using the homemade ice cream to kind of kick off the men in action again. We'll be getting together late August, be looking out for an announcement with that. That's going to do a kickoff with a fantasy football uh, triad team uh, that's going to help with Bible studies and what have you, a little friendly competition to go along the way. More details to come, and then we're going to be having a golf outing uh, late September, early October. So we're getting back fired back up and, uh, with that mission. So just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of it. If you have any questions about the ice cream party on July 28th, see Gavin Barber or myself. Now Eric Hudson. We had a great week at uh, Fuge this week. Um, it was fantastic, actually. Uh, just two things I wanted to read here. So Fuge this, uh, this past week was uh, about revival generation and how the generation needs to be have revival, the entire generation. And it was a fantastic week. Uh, revival started this past week with a bunch of teenagers. I'm seeing a, about 275 teenagers were there and it was an amazing thing to watch and see. But two scriptures that uh, the camp really uh, emphasized. First one was Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. And my people who bear my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. And the other one was Acts three nineteen through 20. Therefore repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus who has seen appointed from, for you as the Messiah. So those two scriptures, we, we, we dove into those throughout the whole week and, and the kids, uh, there were many, many kids who gave their heart to Christ. There are many kids who want to be baptized. It was just a wonderful thing to see. Next year, we are going the 21, 21st. Is it 20? I will get that. Uh, it says, I think it's 22nd to the 28th. 23rd to the 28th. June, 23rd to 28th, of uh, uh, 2025. We're going to North Greenville in South Carolina. Anybody in here who has a teenager, 6th grade to 12th grade, that has any interest in this camp, they do not have to come to this church. It is a wonderful thing for these kids to go and, and have a week where they can just be 100% who they are and worship the way that they love to worship. So it was a great week, and we'll have more information come, or more uh, pictures and things like that for you to see in the next week or two. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Jason and, and um, Eric. And now Miss Jordan has something that she wants to say to you. Oh, all you people are too tall. There we go. Hi, good morning. I'm Jordan Score coming to you on behalf of the children's ministry. Lauren printed out this handy dandy schedule right here. You see all that yellow? That's where we need help. So if you will please consider volunteering to help in one of these yellow spots. The majority of them already have someone volunteering on them. We just need an additional person. We have to have two people in every room. We can't just have one person in there um, and we can't so the people that are back there can't be back there every Sunday. So if you will please consider signing up on one of these dates, um, our children are our future. Um, so if you guys can just look at this, 
put your name down. If you want to switch with someone, you can ask them as well. I'm going to put it up here on the table with a pen. So if you'll just sign up or if you um, don't get a chance to do this, you can email me at the office. I'll be there tomorrow and I can get you put on the schedule. Thanks. And, and what better place to volunteer than with children? <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, excuse <clears throat> me. As we come to you this morning, we come with, all, with thankful hearts, thanking you for the many blessings that you give to us each day. Lord, we thank you for this audience that we have this morning, for the message that we're about to hear. Lord, we thank you for the message we, uh, we've already heard in Sunday school. And we ask that you guide us as we go this week. If it's possible, send us a little bit of rain so everything we have planted doesn't die. But Lord, we, um, we know that it's all in your hands, and so we leave that up to you. But um, we still have wants. Lord, guide us now as we go into this service. Be with us. Help us to stay alert and to, to be able to take what is told to us and, and to use it for your glory. For we're asking in Jesus' name. Amen.
say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth and in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us not jealous about a lot of things, Raymond, but I used to sing that low bass. Thank you for singing it for me. Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Wasn't that music great? I told Shelly to fifth Sunday, add some extra music. I'll try to be short. I've said that before. She said, that's all right. We'll sit and listen in air condition. <laughs> Quick question. Try to start with a question, right? Most Sundays. Can metal float? Somebody said, yeah. This has a lot of echo in it. Can metal fly? Yes, of course it can. Not, not metal in and of itself. Actually, metal cannot fly or float by itself. But when you put it in certain shapes, and especially fly, you put engines on it, it flies, correct? Now, how many of you all understand how all of that works? I don't understand how it works either. But when we finally get to do the Alaska trip that Rich and Lori just got back up, I'm not driving my car over there. I'm certainly not walking. And when we go to Africa next year, I'm not swimming. I'd rather trust that those who know what the physics and the buoyancy and the flight and all those dynamics mean can get me to those places safely, right? Right? We don't have to understand everything to appreciate it and to use it. How many of y'all fully understand the generation of electricity? Thank you. I'm glad. I thought I might be a dummy, and I was expecting a few people to raise their hands. How many of you walk around in the dark or with no air condition? Exactly. If, if, if your air conditioner's not working so good, you need good windows, right? <laughs> My, I just... We don't understand a lot of things. <clears throat> we certainly can't fully grasp how it all works. I understand, you know, the, the weight of the metal and the amount of space and some of those things, but I don't understand how it all works for a ship to cruise on the ocean, much less how a plane can land on a ship in the ocean when it's going up and down. A lot of those things I just don't understand. And if you, if you think you know it a little bit, the slightest amount of randomness or ir irregularity that occurs throws everything off, doesn't it? Nice little flash of lightning and what happens to our computer sometimes. You've got to have the surge protectors. You've got to have other things going on to take care of us. Again, there are many things we don't understand about this life that we can see, that we can personally experience. There's even more about faith that we cannot understand. In Hebrews 11, chapter 1, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. If you can see it, you're not really putting your faith in it. John 
20, verse 29, after Jesus has risen one time and, and he has to come back for Thomas because Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I can stick my hand in his, my fingers in his hand and my hand in his side. And Jesus goes, okay, here you go, Thomas. And he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, blessed, because you have seen me, you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's our faith, is it not? If God is small enough to fit into my box, He's not big enough for my needs. If, if He fits all my checklist of understanding, again... He's not big enough. He's not bigger than us. He's not big enough for what he promises to do. In reality, it's the other way around, isn't it? We need to fit in his, air quotes, box, in a sense. Not everybody gets to heaven. We have to enter his box through faith. By grace, through faith. We believe, and we are saved. It's not the checklist of things I do or the checklist of things that He fulfills for me that has anything to do with salvation. But once we are saved, we need to persevere to the end. We need to live a life of faith to the very end. Do we have doubts? How many of y'all have ever had a doubt before? I hope everybody raises their hand about God. How many of y'all have ever had a question about God? Absolutely. We all have. That's the point. We cannot understand everything about God. But we need to move forward anyway. We cannot explain it all. And the Trinity is probably the one that people have tried hardest to explain. There's just not enough scripture to explain the concept of Trinity. That's why I titled this sermon today, The Unexplainable Three-in-One God. The Unexplainable Three-in-One God. And you'll go, but he's sort of like, and I go, yes, sort of. But he's not. He's more than. He's sort of like water. H2O, correct? You've got ice, and you've got water, and you've got steam. And I have read there are things theoretical and scientific possibilities of having all three in the same place at the same time. But it's very brief. Under very crazy circumstances. Oh, maybe he's sort of like a father and a son. Who, like me, I was a son and I'm a father and I'm a husband. And all those sorts of things. Those help, don't they? Ice, water, and gas. Steam, whatever you want to call it, father, son, husband, different roles. But that's part of the problem of the heresies throughout the earliest part of the church, and still to this day. So we segmentalize, if I can say that, compartmentalize God. And yet God, the first and main thing I want to say is God is eternally coexistent as three in one. He's not God the Father in the creation and Old Testament and God the Son in the Gospels and God the Holy Spirit afterwards. It's not three different gods at different times or one God in three different modes. That's not true. So look with me at a couple of scriptures. Um, I'm going to read some before those, Tyler, okay? In John chapter, excuse me, in Genesis chapter 1. Hope you have a Bible with me, with you, excuse me. You meant what I knew. Genesis chapter 1. You know this passage. I taught, the, taught Bible school how to say it in Hebrew. Landon, you want to try? I'm just teasing. Ladies, you want to try it with me? You heard it. After five or six semesters of Hebrew, that's all I can say in Hebrew. 
That's pretty bad. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God. There's no the in the Hebrew, by the way. It's just in beginning. When things began, God was already there. Okay? By the way, I was getting ordained. I'm, I may have shared this before. and Back 100 years ago, when I was ordained, you had to write out your beliefs, statements, and all that kind of stuff. And they grilled me for over an hour. These pastors who had been pastors for most of them for decades. And here's this green guy coming out of seminary, hadn't had anything to do much with ministry. And they asked me all these questions. And at the end, this one wise man looks over at me. He said, Frank, I have one final question. I'm thinking, what else can they ask? He says, Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God. Do you believe that? I said, yes, sir, I believe that. All things begin with God. Now, who is that God? We're going to talk about him for the next four weeks. But here's one thing that maybe you just kind of overlooked or didn't pay much attention to. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So we know the Spirit was there with God at that time. And God said or spoke, let there be light, and there was light. Enough. You know the rest more or less. Let's turn to John 1 now. And John 1 starts very similarly to Genesis 1. John 1 says, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, that is the Word, was in the beginning with God. And that's a, an interesting Greek construction. He was basically face-to-face -face is what some of those words are trying to say. He was there with Him. And then look at this. All things were made through Him, through the Word, through the Logos... And without him was not anything made that was made. Who is the Logos? John 1, 14. And the word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. So who was the word? Jesus. So who created all that was? When God logos, when God spoke the word, what happened? <laughs> Bang! And there was light. And everything else happened according to his word. Genesis 1 2 says the Spirit was there with him. John 1, 1 through 3 says Jesus was there with him and in fact was the agent of creation. The three in one God existed in beginning. He was already there. In fact, he began all that was, time and everything else. Well, where else do the three in one happen together? Uh, one of the most interesting ones to me is in the baptism of Jesus Christ. One example of that's in Matthew 3, but you know this. Jesus goes to John and he gets baptized. Who is Jesus? What's another name for Jesus? Talking about Trinity. He's the Son of God. Thank you. He's the Son of God. What happens 
to Jesus in the baptism. He goes under the water and he comes up and what happens? <laughs> the Spirit descends from heaven and comes upon him. Now, does that mean he never had the Spirit? No, he's three in one God. But the Spirit, in a special way, came to him. Actually, the heavens were torn in the midst. I love that passage. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And then, what happened? And God spoke. One passage, Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Son, Spirit, Father. All in one. There are many other passages that we could read. And again, remember, I'm using this to tell you that it wasn't God Father, God Almighty, Old Testament, Jesus Son, Gospels, and God's Spirit, Acts and Beyond. All in one, coexisting eternally. So let's read a few verses to see how this works together. We've got some. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is the baseline. One of the more important verses for all of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is called the Shema. That's the word for the beginning of that in Hebrew. Hear, O Israel. And they would write it on a little piece of paper and they would roll it up and they would put it in the mezuzah beside the door so you could tap it on the way into your house. Reminder that God is one. And all the Ten Commandments follow out of that, especially the first four. Another one, Matthew 28. You know this passage. I'm going to actually begin verse 18. When Jesus, uh, 16, Jesus greets his followers on the mountain and some doubted, if you have your Bibles open, and some doubted his 12 are seeing the resurrected Lord and some are doubting. That should give us all hope. We have our moments of weakness. But in 18, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in what? The name of God. The name of, or maybe I should say God. Is that right? Like some of those preachers, God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always. To the end of the age. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all in one. We must be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in God's name. And if you read through Acts, you'll see that some were only baptized in the name of Jesus and didn't have the Holy Spirit, or in the name of God and didn't have the Holy Spirit. So they had to be uh, have their hands laid on them. Interesting that that's the case. Another passage. This is the only passage that actually talks about Jesus being born in all of Paul's writings. Specifically talks about that. And he says, Paul writes, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. There's two already, right? God, the Father, sent forth his Son to, go ahead, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And look here. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. They all work together. Not A, B, and C. It's three and one, all together. And just one more. Paul talks about the three of them in Titus chapter 3. This is an easy one to remember. My father-in-law used to have all these memnonic devices and some of the things that he would remember. And I'm like, oh, okay, i got to remember this here. This is Titus 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. 
Titus 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. There's only three chapters in Titus, so it's pretty easy. And it says this, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. God, our Savior, so, okay, so being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God, our Savior, sent the Holy Spirit to con- guarantee us and confirm us as adopted by faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Again, you have all three, <laughs> excuse me, working together. It's important to remember that, that they are together. Did anybody read the book, The Shack? You need to read it. It's a thin book. I like thin books. I was trying to read a book on vacation these last few days. I got pretty close, but it's not as thin as The Shack. The Shack is a good book. It's actually a movie, too, although I like the book better. But that puts all three of them kind of in and out together in this one place. I won't tell you the whole story. And it's very different than you would ever suppose. But, but to me, the idea that God shows up in ways that are different than we can understand and grasp is what I thought was so interesting from that book. And they work together to accomplish what they um, designed us for. Let's say that. So, the three uh, in one God exists eternally as one. They coexist eternally. Second thing I want to say, <clears throat> and I'll just open this up a little bit today because I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the next three weeks. Um, so, they have, di- second thing, a major thing I want to say is they have distinct functions. And attributes or characteristics. Distinct functions or attributes and attributes or characteristics. So when you think of the Father, God the Father, what do you think about? Making the heavens and the earth. We do, don't we? But who else was involved in the heavens and the earth? We just read that. The Holy Spirit and, and the Son were all there in the in the process. And I'll Read something else about that in a minute. We do tend to think of God the Father as creator. If we think of God in the Old Testament more as the God, then we think of God Almighty, Elohim, Adonai, uh, El Shaddai, which is God Almighty. All kinds of things um, come to mind. Uh, I like um, the idea that God the Father is uh, a conductor. In a sense. I I like music, so that's easy for me to think of. But think of an intact, healthy family. Everybody has their roles, right? Even to the youngest of children uh, that are in the household or or parents or grandparents that might be there. Um, But who's kind of, hopefully, well, the mother kind of glues it together. But who kind of orchestrates everything a lot of times? The father. It's less so in this generation because so many women work, but in places where the husband is the primary breadwinner, it's a little more obvious. But to me, the key is that he is is the conductor, like a musician uh, playing in an orchestra. Uh, I, I love a great concerto, a violin, or I heard one recently of an oboe or cello or some of these wonderful instruments. But it gets a little tedious after a while if you just got this one person goes off and playing all these fancy things. I really like the sum of the sound of everything together. And the more complex for me, the better. I love, for example, Wagner and Shostakovich and Tchaikovsky and those who have a much richer uh, symphonic composition. But the father to me is kind of the one that that kind of holds it all together and keeps it all together. That's my limited way of putting him in a box. That's way too small, right? Second one, the son. 
I've, I've already read from John 1. That's a pretty important passage that he was involved in um, creation, uh, but that he became flesh and dwelt among us. There's a lot there. I want us to read from Colossians chapter 1. This is just absolutely gorgeous. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. Paul is talking about Jesus and what he has done for us and how we need to remain faithful. And in verse 15 it says, He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. That's a theological conundrum right there. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. What a beautiful hymn of praise about Jesus and who he is as part of the Trinity, the three-in-one God. Jesus represented God here on earth in human flesh, and he, he was here for roughly 33 years, and he taught and he modeled God's ways and God's will he was human, yet he was perfect. He was tempted and yet without sin, as Hebrews 4.15 says. In order to be the perfect sacrifice, one sacrifice, once for all time. And then who is this last member of the Trinity? It's the Holy Spirit. The one we Baptists don't like to talk about a whole lot. So I'm going to be gone that Sunday and Mark Cochran's going to preach on that topic. I'm just teasing If you want to read about the Holy Spirit, the best place to find information about that is John 14 through 17. I won't go into all of the details there. If you want to read about the, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you turn to 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Mostly 12 and 14. Uh, but I believe 13 is part of that and some other passages. The Holy Spirit is what God has sent to be with us and in us. And in some mystical way, we abide in God and God in us. That's in that John section. Through the Holy Spirit. It's the only way we can live anything like the Lord Jesus Christ lived. So in reality, everything related to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit... And to our salvation, it's all based on faith, is it not? We cannot fully explain God. Particularly this three-in-one kind of thing. Might almost be easier <clears throat> if we had a pantheon, wouldn't it? Oh, he's the God of this, and she's the God of that. and we don't. It, it, it might almost be easier for us to wrap our mind around it, but that's not a real God. That's a made-up God. So we have to come to grips with God is bigger than us. <clears throat> there is no box that contain Him, no mind that can understand Him. But faith can approach Him. I need to fit into His box, if I might say it that way. I need to check his boxes doing what he asks me to do. I must confess my sin and repent from my sin and turn to him. I must put my faith in him to forgive my sins and to save him. 
that Jesus might be my Lord and that the Holy Spirit might fill me, fill me and seal me for the day of redemption, either when I die or when Christ comes back. I must trust Him for a full and meaningful life now, and I must trust Him in spite of and because of my trials in this life that I face on earth. And I must trust Him for the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. And so this morning, I ask you, not do you understand the Holy Spirit and the Trinity, do you really understand God, but do you believe in Him? Have you put your faith in Him? Have you confessed your sins and put your faith in Him? If you haven't, today's a great day to do so as we begin a discussion of sorts about this God that we serve and we trust. Let's bow in a word of prayer. How great is our God. Words cannot adequately explain who you are, Father. We humbly come to you today before you, acknowledging that you are far beyond anything we can comprehend. So, Father, help us in our lack of faith at times to continue to trust in you, to put our faith in you, to have that hope that is unquenchable and to walk with you each and every day until you call us home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing again a little bit of how great is our God. This is a great time to confess that. And age to age he stands And time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The
these are uh, two that made that decision while we were there. Do you want to introduce yeah. them? Yeah, this is Chloe Batucci <laughs> and Ava Jones. And they're both uh, from that high school, well, middle school high school. All right. So hopefully, um, so hopefully in the uh, weeks ahead, we'll be able to uh, get all this together and figure it out and, uh, and have a baptism. Uh, and it'll be so much more than just one. Thank you, Eric and Courtney and Jordan for taking them. Um, Eric was sick this week, by the way. He called me Monday halfway there and said, it, would it be terrible if I came home? It would not have been, however, what you would have missed. It was amazing. Thank you all for being there for them. June 23rd to 28th, 2025. Got it. North Greenville College University probably now in the big city of Tigerville, South Carolina. So... Let's bow in a word of prayer as we get to go. Father, thank you. <laughs> thank you that we don't have to understand everything. We just profess Jesus and share the gospel. That God loved us so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die for us that anyone who puts their faith in Jesus can be saved and experience eternal life. May we go and tell in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.